welcome, welcome, welcome. I would like to welcome you to yet another episode of the Unpopular Podcast. This is the man, Jalen Hunter. And if you would do me a favor, please subscribe to wherever you're listening. Please subscribe to wherever you're watching. It would definitely mean a lot to me. But this is where we'll start. So for un- unfortunately for Gonzaga, man, <laughs> they land on on a list that they didn't want to land on, man. You'll land on a list with the Patriots. Uh, you'll land on a list kind of like the uh, the Panthers back in 2015. You'll land on a list with uh, Kentucky the, like a few years ago. What does that mean? So Buck Baylor wins the national championship over Gonzaga, and it wasn't even close, bro. They beat – Baylor beat them, what, 86 to 70. And here's the thing. I will be the first person to come on here and admit that I was clearly wrong. I thought – I first thought – let me let me say this. When they first did the brackets and everything, I picked Illinois to win. I thought Illinois had – Almost, I had, they had the size, they had the quickness, they had the offense, they had the defense. I just thought they could put all that together and boom. I also said that Gonzaga was the perfect team. I said Gonzaga is it's going to be hard for anyone to beat Gonzaga due to the fact that they can beat you at so many levels. They can beat you at scoring the ball. They can beat you at shooting threes. They can beat you at mid-range. They can beat you in the post. They can smother you defensively. I just thought Gonzaga was the perfect team. And they were the perfect team. One thing that I did not uh, anticipate was Baylor. I knew Baylor was good offensively. I knew Baylor had the three, the three-headed monster that Davion Mitchell, that Nicole Teague, and they had uh, Jared Butler. But I didn't think that they would be able to score as well against Gonzaga's defense. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> Man, look, first of all, shouts out to Baylor. Shouts out to Baylor for winning their first men's national championship because, you know, a lot of people want to say they won the first na- school's first national championship, but the women's, women's won like two years ago. But shouts out for Baylor for winning their first men's uh, national championship, and it was well-deserved. You know, Baylor was hit hard, or Baylor, just like the world, was hit hard with COVID, and Baylor was good enough to win last year. Um, you know, they, they had pretty much the same team. They had a better center. They they were good enough to win last year, but, of course, COVID hit and everything, and they were hooping before COVID hit. And, and of course, sports had to stop and everything. So this is pretty much two years in the making. And we should have seen this coming. Like I said, I, I was a I was so on Gonzaga how they were undefeated. They were thirty one and zero going into the game. Uh, they, you know, I, I I didn't really look at the fact that Baylor. I, I didn't really look at Baylor's path and think, well, they 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 present problems that Gonzaga has not seen, as far as they're quicker than Gonzaga. They can shoot better than Gonzaga. I think Baylor was the number one three-point shooting team, and it showed <laughs> in the national championship. Yeah, they, I think they were the number one shooting uh, three-point team in the in the in the nation. Uh, they their energy when they come to play, their energy is almost is unmatched. From v, uh, Vita or Veal, the 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 big man who had what eight seven or eight offensive rebounds. Teague was incredible going from coast to coast. Butler couldn't be stopped. They, they just, they put, from the energy standpoint, offensively and defensively, they put together the perfect game. You know, it's, it's you know that their game, they, they, they perfected their game plan to a T. Because if you look at Gonzaga, like I said, Gonzaga can beat you shooting threes. They can beat you going in, like in, in the paint, and they beat you smoth- with a smothering defense. Gonzaga was not good at anything on Monday. The thing is, the only person that was okay was Jalen Suggs, and he really didn't turn it on until the second half. It was 
Drew Timmy, who a lot of people were would say was this um this tournament's most most outstanding player if they would have won, he was a liability. In fact, he hurt Gonzaga more than he helped Gonzaga on Monday. It was it was a perfect game for for Baylor. They came out perfect. They came out and smacked him in the in the mouth. And it took, like I said, they Baylor was able to climb back to like within nine, but that was the closest they can get. It was it was just a perfect game, man. And and the the conversation is had. Does Gonzaga has has Gonzaga been hurting themselves because they're in the WCC, which is the Western Conference? or Western Central Conference, I believe. I think that has something to do with it. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not a – I am not diminishing what Baylor did. Baylor won the national championship. They deserve to win the national championship. They right now stand as the best team in the nation. And honestly, if it wasn't for COVID, they could be back-to-back champions because Baylor was hooping last year. But let's talk about the WCC. And this, you see this happen a lot. This is why I believe, this is one reason. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but this is one reason why I believe Baylor, I mean, no, Gonzaga struggles so much in the, in the, in the tournament as far as getting over that hump and winning. When you look at their, their, their competition, right? Now, yes, they, they again, they were 31 to 0, and they played some tough teams. Like, they destroyed U, uh, USC. They won against UCLA, but that was all in the tournament. They play like St. Mary's and Stony Brook. And and while those those are potentially good teams, it's like when you look at other teams that they've – like let's look at their track record, right? Gonzaga loses to North Carolina. A lot of people, uh, uh, of course, before, um, before COVID and everything and before the last few seasons – ACC has some of the best talent, North Carolina, uh, Duke, uh, Florida State, you know, uh, uh, Syracuse, Clemson. It's no, the ACC is touted as one of the most competitive conferences. If you look, they lost to uh, Baylor. Baylor had to go against Kansas. They had to go against, which is the Big 12. They had to go against um, o- Oklahoma State, who had Cade Cunningham. Like, they... Baylor's, they're more battle-tested because they play better opponents. Hell, most of the ACC, let, let's just let's just look at the WCC. Most of the, I don't, in fact, I think Gonzaga was the only WCC team that made it to the conference. It's like when you're playing, comp, when, when you're playing to the level, when your level of competition is nowhere close to the level of competition that a Baylor would play or that a North Carolina would play or that a UCLA would play. It, it's just, ugh, it sucks, man. And I shouldn't, we should have known, man. I, let me say this. I should have known. When I saw Baylor just destroy Houston, and I thought Houston had a really good shot of making it to the national championship, I was like, ah, well, I, I was just, I was just so- sticking to my pick, even though what I, what we've seen, like I said, this is two years in the making, man. Two years in the making, they're they're well co- Baylor's well coached. Baylor has three stars, and I've been saying that they had a three headed monster, which was Davion T, Davion Mitchell, Mikio Teague, and Jared Butler, and and Jared Butler won the most outstanding player in the in the tournament, which he which deservedly so. It you know it it just it Baylor. Baylor put on a perfect game, and Baylor, like I said, if it wasn't for COVID, I believe that they were – I don't know if they would have, but I, I believe that they were good enough to be back-to-back champions. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's unfortunate for Gonzaga. They, they get put on a list with, you know, Kentucky, uh, what, a couple years ago when they had Carl Anthony Towns and uh, they had the Harrison Twins, they had Devin Booker went undefeated till they got to, I believe, the final four and lost to Frank Kaminsky in Wisconsin. Uh, even though they weren't undefeated, they kind of get put in the same group as as the Carolina Panthers 2015 with, uh, uh, what's his name, Cam Newton. He has the MVP. They, they just destroy people throughout the whole season. The only one loss was at the end to Atlanta when they really didn't play everybody. 
and then uh, they just get destroyed in the, in the Super Bowl to the Broncos. Of course, we know about the 18-0 and 0, um, pa- Patriots. They go up against the Giants. We know what happens there. They just get put on the un- – they just get they- – you know, Gonzaga lands on a – tough list it doesn't take away from the fact that they had a great season i mean you went 31 and one but but you still you lost it then so and it's you know, I, and and this year is well next year is actually going to be very interesting now of course there are some players now of course let me say this due to covid and due to everything this year everyone gets pretty much this year free as far as eligibility as far as this this year doesn't count to anyone's eligibility. So honestly, everyone can come back. Now, of course, if you're a senior, you'll probably have to enroll in another class or try to get your master's or something. But you can play this. You can play again next year. And it's interesting, it's interesting to see what the landscape is gonna look like next year, seeing as though, like I said, every everyone gets a an extra eligibility year due to COVID. Um of course, you have some, the players that we know are going to to or should go to the next level. Will like we know Jalen Suggs is more than likely not staying in Gonzaga. Cade Cunningham's already uh, declared for the draft. I don't think Jared Butler. I mean, his, his Jared Butler and Davion T. Davion Mitchell. Their their draft stock is pretty much there. I wouldn't go back. Um, of course. See, see what happens with Quentin Grimes. Like, I just think that it's going to be interesting seeing that there's almost what 600 to 700 kids in the transfer portal. I'm just excited to see what next year is going to bring. Now, I'm not, I'm not negating what happened, and again, we're, I want to give Baylor their props, but this year set up. In fact, the last two years set up a very interesting, a very interesting. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next year. See who comes back. See players that maybe are on the maybe seniors. Are they going to are they going to uh you know try to do master classes and and come back for another season? Players that maybe are on the fringe of being drafted. Do they come back? Uh, or do they do they enter the transfer portal? You know, we we see a, a couple big names that's in the transfer portal. I mean, there's six seven hundred kids. So again, man, shouts out to Baylor for winning the national championship. Shouts out to Gonzaga for a good, pretty good season. Uh, shouts out to Jared uh, Butler for winning the most outstanding player. It, you know, Baylor Baylor <laughs> Baylor put on a perfect show, and and that's the thing. It was a very entertaining. Um, it was very entertaining, even though it was a blowout. It was very entertaining because it was it was good to see Baylor. You can tell what their what their game plan was, and they did it to perfection. And the thing is, they did it to perfection the entire game. There was, of course, Gonzaga won on a couple of runs, but it's Gonzaga. I mean, you're you're thirty one and 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 O for a reason at that point. It's like, but it was it was good. Now, again, shouts out to Baylor. However. Truth be told, the women's side was a little more was a little more interesting, a lot more interesting than the men's side as far as the national championship. Shouts out to Stanford for winning the national championship against Arizona. They they won what fifty four to fifty three. Uh, and 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 I say that it was interesting because it's like I, you don't really want to go into a national championship and, and watch a blowout, even though again. Shouts out to Baylor, nothing against them, you know, and and they, I mean, and here's the thing, here's the thing. Before I keep going, nobody wants to watch a blowout. However, unless you're the team blowing them out, like I've been on this side where it's just like everyone's upset that they came to watch a blowout, but the team that came and blowing them out, like that is what it is. So that's nothing against Baylor, you know. Baylor did what they're supposed to do, but back to the women's side, um. This is another Stanford is another team where I, you, you can't, I can't you should we see we should have seen this coming. Uh, they were the they were they were the number one overall team, um, and of course 
back to my picks in the beginning. I picked Maryland. That was a little hometown bias. That was also the fact that they averaged damn near 95 points uh, a game, which is leading the the nation. Um, but there was there was there was when you look at Stanford, they are a complete team. They it's kind of like Gonzaga. They they can beat you three shooting threes. They can beat you with the mid range with with Haley Jones. They can beat you. They they are stacked at almost every position. Not to mention they're incredibly coached. And they again, it's like even though you know Haley Jones is their best player, and shouts out to her for winning the most outstanding player. I think she has seventeen points in the national championship. Stanford can beat you in so many ways, and the thing is, we've seen Stanford have. Stanford didn't have the greatest game, the national championship, and they were still able to uh, still able to pull through. And shouts out to shouts out to Arizona, man. Nobody, hell, it's funny when we we know how people say nobody expected them to make it. Well, you can you can you can definitely say that for the national for Arizona in the national championship because the NCAA they didn't even put Arizona on their uh, they didn't they didn't market. Arizona at all or advertise Arizona at all like they had their you know final four teams and this and the third even though Arizona was in it they didn't even have them in the video they didn't even have them in the like they didn't even have them in the promotional so it's 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 crazy that one of your final four teams you didn't even have in the promotional no meaning you didn't have them winning at all like you didn't think there was a chance in heaven or hell that they were going to beat UConn and I, I admit, I, I didn't think they were going to beat UConn either, but I would have still planned for that. <laughs> but I, I don't know what the hell. It's just another another indication that NCAA really doesn't understand what's going on. But, um, yeah, man, Stanford, Stanford is, has been – they've been a complete team this entire year. And it kind of goes back to the same thing I said with Baylor. Stanford was good enough last year to win a national championship. If it wasn't for COVID, like all these players came back and, and like, again, they're stacked at every position. If you look at their roster, um, they, they, they are, they, they can go to two or three deep at each position. Like, I mean, like I said, Haley Jones, you have, uh, Cameron Brink, you have Anna Wilson, Lexi Hugh Hall or Hull, you have Kara Williams, you have my my Dodson. It's just they're like they they are complete. They're a complete team and they're a deep team and they're tall. Like I didn't realize how tall Stanford was until I was watching them. Um, until I was watching the national championship, I said, "God, God, Lee, bro, like they are tall as hell." It's like it, it's man. Hey, congratulations to them! Congratulations to Stanford, Stanford Cardinals. And again, this is that's another thing that that's another thing you kind of should have seen it coming. Even though I was, I picked Maryland. I also thought you know South Carolina could win. A lot of people had UConn, but the difference between Stanford and UConn is one their size, and two Stanford has a lot of uh, a lot of upperclassmen. Now, that's a conversation that should be had. I think now, just because your team is full of seniors, that doesn't mean that you're going to automatically be better than a team full of one and dones. That's not what I'm saying at all. Hell. One and dones are one and dones because they're usually good enough to be NBA players. They just can't go to the NBA at the time. Um, but there is something to be said, especially in the women's side. Usually, when you stay longer and you know you get another year or get more years to train and get more years to experience how to operate and maneuver in a college game which is different from high school completely you see a lot the, a lot of the teams that are 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 good especially you know at that moment you know at the in college are upper class like teams that's full of upperclassmen like if you go back to the men's look at that UMBC team a couple years ago that beat Virginia I'm and I'm again I'm not saying that a team full of seniors are automatically better than a team full of one and dones, but 
that UMBC team was was littered with seniors and juniors, and those those players know how to you know know how to handle themselves in that moment. And Virginia really wasn't. If you look at if you look at Stanford uh, this year, Stanford was filled with juniors and seniors and sophomores. So I think there is something to be said about you know having having a a, a team full of players that's been there. Now again, I'm not taking away from the fact that Stanford is is an incredible team. I'm not taking away from the fact that you know Haley Jones is is arguably one of the best, if not the best player in college basketball, even though we'll talk about that a little moving forward. But shouts out to Stanford for winning the national championship. It was well-deserved. Uh, shouts out to Arizona. Shouts out to Arizona, man. It, you know, it was, it, that was a tough game, man. Shouts out to, shouts out to, uh, to Ari McDonald, man. She had 22. She unfortunately missed the game winner, but it was a tough game winner too. Like, I don't know how you drew that up. It was like a turnaround and there was a timeout left. But shout, like, it, it was tough, man. Sienna Pe- uh, Pellington. Shouts out to uh, 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 Trinity Baptiste. Shouts out to Arizona. They, 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 they shocked the world. And even though they didn't win, they uh, nobody, including myself, had them had them going. Hell, you were you were a six seed. I mean, no, a, yeah, third seed. No, of course, and you're on the same side as UConn. You're in the same. Yeah, I just and you were in the same bracket, like same region as NC State, which a lot of people had at least going to the Final Four, including myself. It's just. Shout Arizona. It's like you look at you look at what happened with Gonzaga on the men's side, right? And it's like, yeah, that's a failed season. You go thirty one and zero, and then get the national championship and get your doors blown off by Baylor. But there's some seasons that you can like, like Arizona, man. Um, n- nobody expected them to be here. I didn't expect them to be here, and they made it. Now, of course. There's no moral victories or whatever, but you can definitely hang your hat on the fact that you're well coached, even though, you know, Ari McDonald's going to be gone and, and some of the, the ladies are going to be gone. You definitely um, showed the world that you sh- you should have been on that stage, especially beating Stanford by one and or losing to Stanford by one and having a shot to win it at the end. So. Again, shouts out to Stanford for winning the national championship. Shouts out to Arizona for making it. Shouts out to Gonzaga for winning the national championship. I mean, ooh, ooh, I'm sorry. Shouts out to Baylor for winning the national championship. And shouts out to Gonzaga for making it. I mean, yeah, it's a failed season. If I be- if I was on Gonzaga, I wouldn't be like, oh well, at least we went 31 and I mean 31 and one. No, I would have been like, we failed. But uh, hell, you can't take away from the fact that they did go 31 and one. So. Shouts out to Baylor and Stanford for winning the national championship on both the men and the women's side. Most definitely most deserved. Moving forward. So the big news last week was um, Major League Baseball moves the All-Star game in the draft out of Atlanta due to the new voting restrictions pretty much or the bill that was passed um, that kind of it does it doesn't really stop well, let me say this the the bill is pretty much the thing that there a lot of people are hung up on is the fact that Georgia now does not allow uh voters to be fed or you know fed food or or given drinks in long lines now that definitely hurts the vote due to the fact that Georgia is a, a huge state and those lines can be incredibly long and a lot of those people are a little older and they depend on the food and the and the drink that they get from the vote so it's just another form of voter suppression now of course you can kind of see this coming as seeing as though georgia has always been a red state it, it it flipped this year um but you see a lot of a lot of organizations share their disapproval of the voter voter suppression it's pretty much voter suppression um and 
the ML, you know, the Atlanta Falcons came out and said some Tyler Perry studios, I believe came out and said something, you know, it, it's definitely this, this is definitely bigger than sports, but the MLB pulling out of or or pulling their all-star game and draft out of Atlanta was huge for a lot of reasons. It's huge because it it definitely in, impacts the the revenue both for the W I mean for the MLB and for Atlanta. I mean Atlanta of course they don't need it, but there was so much revenue that was going to be coming in from an all-star game, especially an all-star game that can have fans now. Uh, we saw the other day, even though I'm not, I don't agree with it, but we saw the Rangers. Uh, is it? Yeah, I think the Rangers. They they were the first MLB team to have 100 percent capacity. It looked great, even though, but it, I was just like, ah, I mean, we're still in the pandemic. But again, the All Star Game was going to bring in so, and the draft was going to bring in so much money for the city, and the fact that you pull out of it, it's it really shows. You know, it really shows that sports, it, this is bigger than sports, man. It's like, it kind of goes back to during the pandemic and, and during the bubble for the NBA when you saw the NBA was the first ones to boycott a game due to, uh, you know, another African-American unjustly killed by the police or shot by the police. And then it was just a trickle effect. You know, MLB, uh, ba uh, ho hockey, teams were just fed up with it. And it, it's like when the real world, it's like a lot of people don't like to associate sports with the real world. They think that it should be separate. But when, I mean, at the end of the day, these are still athletes. These are still people. And whether you're shooting a ball or throwing a ball, it's like, or, or, or hitting it with a bat, it's like the real world stuff still affects you. And, I, you know, shouts out to Major League Baseball. I don't think they, I think they get a lot of things wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not a proponent of a lot of things that the MLB does, but I do like the fact that they were, they, they got in front of something that was, that was huge and that they didn't have to, because people will still understand. I mean, if you still had an all-star game in Atlanta, nobody would have been like, ah, well, you know, they're, they're siding with the the oppressors like nobody would say that but the fact that they they took that um they took that route definitely indicates that they tried they're trying to get it right especially they moved that Jones to, to Colorado which <laughs> I don't know if you know much but Denver and Atlanta are two different places so you know shouts out shouts out to to Major League Baseball and you know, you're starting to see, you know, a lot of people came out, a lot of people from from baseball circles to to, to people that's not even in sports and, and shared their frustration with it. And, and they're 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 talking about people should boycott the MLB. Hey, you're going to do what you do. I really don't care. I just like the fact that this is just another this is just another organization not putting or not just confiding to something that, sh you know, they should confide to, you know what I mean? So now this kind of brings on another, uh, another question as in, I don't think that this is going to, I mean, it, it brings, it brings light to it, but I don't know if this is going to exactly, you know, change anything as far as like the, the, the racial divide or whatever in Atlanta, or, or Georgia in, 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 in general. But one thing I said, one thing that somebody said, and I agree completely is this, this will go a whole, this is, this, um, you know, move would, would be on an entirely different scale. If golfers boycotted the masters. Now the masters, I mean, their name, the Masters has been racist since. I mean, they had to tone down the racism because Tiger Woods was dominating. But the Masters have been racist for God knows how long. I mean, the name Masters is derived from slave masters uh, escaping to, to places, escaping to golf courses to golf. So, and the, I mean, I think that the, the Masters didn't fully... Um, 
fully in there. They 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 didn't fully integrate with African Americans until like 1993, and that was, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, you know, due to Tiger Woods. So I think that you want to talk about making a statement. You know, it was that statement would probably be on a bigger scale um, than the NBA boycotting the game. Um, boy, yeah. And, and the thing is, to me, that was when, when the NBA boycotted and it, it sent a ripple effect throughout all the sports. I would say that was probably one of, if not the biggest moment in sports history. Let golfers boycott the Masters and pretty much put the Masters on notice. And why do I say this? As we know, the Masters, the one of their biggest, their famous places is Augusta, Georgia. And, you know, anyone that is money that's usually Caucasian go there it's it's a lot if you have if 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 the boy if the masters is boycotted that will send a flood that will open the floodgate for so many things now i don't think it's going to happen because golfers are, are not baseball players baseball players are not nba players so it's it, it goes a little differently but boy oh boy if 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 they boycotted the Masters, man, oh man, you talking about change? That I mean, yes, the you know Atlanta loses a lot of money. Uh, Georgia as a whole loses a lot of money, seeing as though you're losing an All Star game and you're losing a draft, especially with America, you know, one of the world's biggest sports, which is baseball. You're losing a lot of money, and that definitely hurts. That definitely stings, but. If you lose the Masters, boy, now I'm not saying the Masters is already rooted in in racism, so it's not going to it's not going to go anywhere. But if you have your players, your bit, your your top players, your your um your Roy McIlroy's, your Phil Mickelson's, um, you have them, Jordan Spieth or Spieth, you have them boycott, man, oh man, you talking about some change will come that would be it <laughs> but uh yeah man again shouts out to the mlb man for doing what they're doing um shouts out to denver for now getting an all-star game so uh hey shouts out to y'all moving forward so um the biggest the biggest football news was i think that happened like two days ago sam darnold was traded to the P- panthers for like a sixth round pick and like a second and third, which I know I made it sound like it wasn't significant, but you're trading for three three picks, and you had to pay like pay him like nineteen million dollars. That that's a lot. Now you have you have people on two sides of this fence. There's nobody that's in the middle. Like we'll see. No, you have two people on. You have people that are saying this is a horrible trade. I mean, you look at the you look at how much. The Panthers had to give up. You got three draft picks, plus you have to pay this man 19 because you exercise his fifth year option. Uh, the people like that's a lot of money. Sings, or that's a lot to give up for a player that we saw how bad he was on the Jets. We saw the fact that he was one of the most touted quarterbacks coming out of college, coming out of USC, and he has turned into one of the most one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. I mean, his accuracy is off. His decision-making is off. Uh, you know, we saw what happened in, in New York, and it wasn't good. Like, it was not good at all. So, I understand people on that side. I also understand the people on the other side, as far as this is a great trade for for Carolina Panthers. I mean, you get a young quarterback. You get someone that, at least on paper, is better than Teddy Bridgewater. You only give up – you don't give up a first. You give up, like, a second, a third in 2022 – and you give up a sixth, and you're getting a young player, and you're getting him out of a situation that's not winning. It's like I, one thing that a lot of people don't really like to talk about or like to bring up is the fact that you're really only as good as the organ, the situation that you're put in. It's now there's there's some players that can overcome a bad organization, but it's tough, especially in the NFL. I mean, you look at, hell, you look at, now, uh, uh, take away from all the court cases and stuff, 
I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the team. But look at look at Deshaun Watson. You put him on the Houston Texans, who does not have a history of being that good, and you you see what's going on. You you see, it, it's just when you put a quarterback in a lose lose situation, especially when Adam Gase is your coach. Now Adam Gase, he gets his uh, he gets his um his 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 medals for coaching Peyton Manning but that's Peyton Manning he's one of the greatest coach uh, quarterbacks of all time I think I could have coached Peyton Manning and probably gotten a Super Bowl or two like that's 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 just Peyton Manning but we also see Adam Gase almost every quarterback he has coached has been god awful with him but better outside and the biggest the biggest um the biggest example of that is Ryan Tannehill so you get him you get him away from Adam Gates you get him away from the Jets the Jets didn't have a, a they they were one of if not the worst offensive line the entire time Sam Darnold was there I was they they actively took away his they took away his pieces they took away Robbie Anderson they took away uh, 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 the running game just I mean they gave away Le'Veon Bell they they did not do anything to help Sam Darnold now again now the onus is on Sam Darnold you're going to a better organization that is Carolina you're going to a better offensive line you have weapons you you're reunited with Robbie Anderson you have DJ Moore um Hell, you have a running game, Christian McCaffrey. You have a good coach in Matt Rule. It's now the, the onus is on him. Now, if he still is bad, and if it, it was if it was more him than the organization, then I would be the first to come on here and say, "Hey, it's it's on Sam Darnold," because it is on Sam Darnold at this point. I'm not saying that he they're good enough to win a Super Bowl. I mean, if you look at the Panthers roster, they're not good enough to win a Super Bowl, but. They're at least good enough to be eight and eight, or at least good enough to to contend for a playoff spot, and that is only contingent on how good Sam Darnold is. And again, a lot of people are looking at what they saw in New York, and it's like, ah, he's got awful. <laughs> but a lot of people's like, well, again, they he he was not put in the in the most healthiest position, so. I I am one of the people, I am one of the very few, if not the only person that's on the fence as far as I want to see how he does. If he I think Sam Darnold is better than what he put out in New York. Seeing as though New York didn't give him any favors, they really didn't help him at all. Like New York, it wasn't the best, it wasn't the easiest place to win at. So I'm on that side saying, "Hey, he's in a new environment." He's in, he's better coached. He he has he has he has weapons. He has a better offensive line. Listen and and I don't know what's gonna happen with Teddy Bridgewater, but if Teddy Bridgewater's there, you can get mentored by Teddy Bridgewater. I j I want to see him succeed, and I think that I let I mean the the Carolina Panthers give him the best chance to succeed. We just have to see. I you know I you just have to see. So you know. Uh, I understand the people that are saying, hell, but what the hell? I mean, you're still a quarterback. And, and, and I do agree with this. Again, there's some players, not not all of them, but there's some players that you can drop them in any situation and they can flourish. I mean, people forget how bad Indianapolis was when they got, um, what's his name, Andrew Luck. And Andrew Luck got them to the freaking AFC championship. Like, that but that's that's once in a generation talent like that's Andrew Luck even though he did uh, retire early I mean it's Andrew Luck so it's just that again there's not a lot of players that can do that hell I mean and I'm not saying that it's it's only due to the organization but Tom Brady was don't think it was all Tom Brady that happened with the Patriots like Tom Brady getting drafted by the Patriots was a blessing in disguise for both of them. So, you know, it, it's it's we just have to wait and see. Now, again, I don't. I think people are 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 putting unrealistic expectations on the situation, as far as 
now that it's just like, oh, well, now he has to win a Super Bowl or he has to make it to the NFC Championship or he has to this and the third. Don't don't forget, Carolina Panthers is, in a, is still in a tough division. I mean, you're in the same division with the Super Bowl winning champions in the in the Broncos. I mean, not Broncos, the Buccaneers. You're in the in, in the same division as the Saints. And even though I think it's going to be Jameis Winston as their starting quarterback, you still have Michael Thomas. You still have Alvin Kamara. You still have Sean Payton. And you're in the same division as uh, um, what's the what's the what's the man's uh. Atlanta Falcons. So, yeah, man, it's it's still a tough division, but um, yeah, uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens with Sam Darnold. I'm excited to. See, I hope that it was more the organization than him. Now, if I was wrong, I would definitely come on here and say, yeah, he's he's god awful. But I'm not willing to say that yet because we've seen flashes of Sam Darnold. We've seen great, great great flashes of Sam Darnold. And I just think that, especially in football, you're a product of the organ. You're a product of what's around you. Now, again, there's, there's very, very, very few people that can overcome bad situations, but especially in NFL, that's incredibly difficult and that's incredibly rare, rare to see. So, you know, I, I think Sam Darnold, I don't think he's horrible. I think that he did need a, a, a fresh, a fresh, um, a fresh, pl- uh, a fresh organization. And the thing is, if he turns out to be a, a great pickup for the the Panthers, they didn't give much, even though it's three draft picks. And on the paper, it's just like, Ugh, you know, it's three draft picks. If he turns out to be really good for them, they they didn't they didn't lose a first rounder. They didn't. I mean, they didn't lose their their what second overall pick this year. They they lost a second rounder what in 2022 and 23 or something. They lost a third rounder, I believe, or first rounder in 2023, and and a six round pick for 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 you know for a, a quarterback that you hope that can turn your organization around. That's not a lot. Now, if it turns out to not be not not matriculating anything, my fault, then yeah, that that's a lot. But yeah, we have to wait and see. But um, shouts out to Sam Darnold. I'm excited to see what happens moving forward. So the show is moving forward. <laughs> um, I I, th- I I feel like I talk about this this girl almost every um, at least for the past few few weeks. I've been talking about this girl every uh every episode and rightfully so but shouts out to Paige buck buckner uh buck buck back buck becker jesus christ listen <laughs> shouts out to Paige becker for winning the woman's wooden award she is the first ever freshman to do so and i think she's the first player ever um in the women's side to sweep every player of the year award she was eligible for i believe she was eligible for like five awards and she won all five this just this just adds to my point that I said last week as far as I don't understand I mean the this girl and and, and 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 this girl is good enough to be in the WNBA right now. Hell, she is a freshman that that swept all it's not just freshman of the years. She swept all the player of the year awards. And and rightfully so. Now there's people that were saying, "Hey, bro, this college." Okay, so you're telling me what what she clearly clearly she's good and she's the best hands down woman in college basketball. You're telling me that that can't translate right now to the WNBA. And a lot of people like, you know, they need time to develop this and a third. If that's the case, if they need time to develop, why why do the men don't need time to develop? Why is it that Cade Cunningham can can make can can go one and uh, one and done? Why is it that Jalen Suggs can? And honestly, another thing that I don't like is they're they're that's pretty much what they're supposed to do. Like the men, you're 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 frowned upon if you stay longer than a year if you're good enough to leave after one. You know, a lot of people look like, wait, why did he stay for three years? Or why did he stay for two years if he was good enough to be drafted after the first? It's like, 
you, your draft stock gets so low and you're you're frowned upon if you stay longer. But you have to stay longer for the women's. It's just it don't make no sense. But again, I'm not going to go down this road again. I'm not going to go down this road. I already had this conversation. It was in my last episode, but shouts out to Paige Becker for winning, for being the first freshman ever to win the w- Women's Wooden Award, which is pretty much their MVP of college basketball. Um, I think I think Luca Garza won it for the men's, um, which I mean, rightfully so. What he did at Iowa was incredible. Um, but again, shouts out to Paige Becker. So definitely, definitely well deserved. Moving forward. Oh, man. You know, it, it's a brush of fresh air when um, organizations get it right. Uh, and, and I think it's a brush of fresh air because a lot of times, most of the time, the organization gets it wrong. Now, at, where is this coming from? I want to shout, shout out to North Carolina. First of all, again, I want to I want to definitely shout out Roy Williams. Um one of our most successful one of the most successful coaches in college basketball history uh of course like i said he retired last week it was a whole episode go watch my last one or list yeah go watch my last episode we talked about it um but in that episode i said that there should be really only three candidates it should be Herbert Davis, it should be Steve Robinson, I believe, or it should be Jerry Stackhouse. The reason why I said that because Jerry Stackhouse is coached in the G League. He's also coached uh, at Vanderbilt, um, and he's an alumni. Uh, of course, he played one of the one of the North Carolina basketball greats. Steve, uh, he was he's been in the organization for over twenty years, and Hibbert Davis. Hibbert Davis was been there, I believe, 18, 19 years. Um, he left a very successful uh, broadcasting career to come uh, uh, be an assistant coach for Roy Williams. And I, to me, like I said, I said it had to be those three. Now, I, I knew when I said that that there was a, a likelihood that it might not be seeing as though North Carolina has never had an African-American coach. Um, and is is you really don't see a lot of blue bloods ha- or, or top organizations have African American coaches like it's very the 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 Florida states, the Houston's they're very rare, especially and and, and you know again, and shout no no disrespect to Florida State or Houston, but Florida State and Houston is not Duke, North Carolina, Kentucky, so. It's very rare to see an African American uh, coach at a at a prestigious school like a North Carolina, and I I, I want to applaud them for getting it right. So they named Hibbert Davis, who again was a longtime assistant coach for Roy Williams, as a new head coach, being becoming the first African American coach for the team. Um. Again, I, and and the thing that I like is, you know, he addressed the media, he addressed the the organization, I mean, the the school, and he pretty much, you know, he's he's a, he's elated to be the head coach, um, and he's not trying, he, he's not trying to be Roy Williams, he's just trying to, you know, continue the success that North Carolina has had, uh, and I and I like that, I like the fact that again. You you allow an African American coach. This is one of those rare situations where an African American coach gets put in a, in a in a favorable situation for him. Like I said, we always we mostly talk about African Americans getting put in a in a in a horrible situation. Like um like homie the the head coach for the Houston Texans now. Like he's he's putting David Cully. He's put in a tough tough situation. Um of course Lovey Smith when he went to not Lovey, yeah, Lovey Smith. When he went to um, Illinois, like that, that wasn't a that wasn't really a good organization. Usually, African Americans are put in those those type of situations. Hell, nobody thought Brian Flores was going to succeed. I don't care what any Dolphins fan says. Nobody thought Brian Flores was going to succeed, and he has. I like the fact that Roy, I mean Hibbert Davis, is put in a situation that is North Carolina that is for him to succeed. And don't think that this is not going to help recruiting either. I mean, you're going, you have the chance to play 
now for the first African American coach in in the in North Carolina. And yeah, that's that to me is going I'm not gonna say that every player is gonna go there, of course. But I think that this definitely helps recruiting, seeing as though a lot of people wanna play for history and this is history. So and it's not like and the thing is, he you know, he was definitely he's definitely well deserving. Again, he he's been a great assistant coach. He's been there for 18, 19 years. Um, he's he's pretty much learned under the tutelage of Roy Williams, who was the third most winning coach in college basketball history. Um, it to me, this was a perfect hire. Again, I I I had I had Hibbert Davis as number one, but I wouldn't be upset if you know Steve got it or or Jerry Stackhouse. I just wanted somebody that was in the organization I wanted somebody that pe- fans knew and I wanted somebody that deserved it you know so many times and you even heard so many times the organization will have the perfect coach there hell um what was the org what was the jump where you had uh Portland was it Portland no it wasn't Portland oh the the Nets you had the perfect assistant coach there and he was African American. He's been assistant coach for a minute, and you still go with Steve Steve Nash. So, um, you know, I'm ex- you know I'm ex- I'm excited for Herbert Davis. He's, he's definitely well deserved. Most de- and it was the Timberwolves. The Timberwolves did that too. You fired Flip Saunders. You had an African American um, assistant coach who was there longer than Flip Saunders, and he didn't get the he didn't get the job. So. Yeah, but shouts out to Hibbert Davis for um shouts out to Hibbert Davis for being the new head coach of and being the first African American head coach for North Carolina. Um, I'm excited. I'm again, I'm a North Carolina fan, so this, you know, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited to see how his how, what his tenure, which hopefully is a long one, what his tenure looks like in as a Tar Heels coach, and um. It's definitely well deserved. So shout out to him. Moving forward, um, Drew Holiday signs a four year extension with the Bucks. This is something that I just wanted to highlight. Uh, a lot of the times, the media doesn't cover players like Drew Holiday, um, seeing as though he's not really a flashy player. He's not really on a. He was never on a flashy team. I mean, he was playing with the New Orleans Pelicans for the longest. Um, but Drew Holiday, hell, if you look at, if you listen to a lot of NBA players, most of NBA players, and they talk about who one of the, who are the best guards, almost every one of them, not saying he's the best, but almost every one of them has Drew Holiday as probably the most underrated player as far as media-wise. Uh, people know how good Drew Holiday is, and so do the Bucks for signing him to a four-year extension. I, I thought that this was one of the biggest moves for uh for agency moves um last season due to the fact that the Bucks even though he's not the best scorer the you know the Bucks get a player in Drew Holiday that one is an incredible defender he's he can lead it well he can keep a team afloat and you have him alongside Giannis that'll do numbers for Giannis and and kind of get the ball out of Giannis's hands at times um it's well deserved and you know while I do think that the Bucks may need an uh may need another guard alongside Drew that can create his own shot. Um Drew Holiday being on the Bucks makes them immensely better than he they would without him. Um so shouts out to Drew Holiday for um signing a four year extension and, and earning a four year extension with the Bucks. It's definitely well deserved and the Buc- it's a it's a win win situation because the Bucks get one of the best defenders slash players slash underrated players in the league. So shouts out to Drew Holiday. And before we go, um I know this is a sports podcast. I like to keep it with sports, but I am going to um sign off today uh asking that you send prayers up for the rapper DMX, Earl Simmons. Um I grew up my mom's a huge DMX fan, and I grew up listening to DMX. And, of course, for people that don't know, uh, 
you know, he I, he overdosed, and now I think he's in a in a vegetable state. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 just it's crazy how one situation, um, or one moment in time, can change life. Uh, of course, the the video is is going around saying that his close friend at the time um laced his laced his uh weed with with crack and it, it it sent it sent DMX spiraling and he's been struggling with it ever since um I just ask that you send prayers up of course I don't know DMX personally but I do know that it's tough you know situations like that is tough when one moment can completely change your life and one moment that you didn't even expect. And uh, I'm sending my prayers up to DMX. I hope that, um, I pray that God has his hands on his family. I pray that God has his hands on him. I pray that God, this is just another test that DMX is going to be able to uh, rise up from and, and overcome. And I ask you, the viewers, the listeners, whoever rocks with me, whoever rocks with the podcast, please also send up prayers for DMX as well. Um, again, I usually don't do this because I like to, you know, keep it with sports, but this is somebody's life. I mean, there are things in life, most things in life is bigger than sports. This is just, you know, sports is just a thing, but these are people's lives. So, um, I send, I send my uh prayers up for a speedy recovery from for DMX and I hope that you uh my my viewers my listeners um I hope that you do the same as well and there you have it that has been this week's episode of the unpopular podcast I appreciate you guys I love you guys I hope you have a great great um I hope you have a great great day great great week and I'll see you guys when I see you happy birthday Brittany uh and until next time, much love. Mm-hmm.